We've heard it time and time again. Singapore is crazy rich. They can buy anything they want, and their country has all the luxury. Yet, is the concept of crazy rich in Singapore about every single Singaporean? Or is it just those who live in the top 1% of society? Well, one of the consistent problems about rich countries is that they get paid a lot, but they also have a lot of expenses. Living in Singapore, you'd have an average salary way above most other countries, this is true, but you'll also have to pay home costs, food, transportation, taxes, and the like, some of which will drain out one's money. So, in reality, are Singaporeans really crazy rich? To understand this concept, let's talk about data. Data is necessary in finding out just how much Singaporeans really make and how much they spend. The first data to understand is income. How much do Singaporeans make? According to data published by SmartWealth, which is a Singapore-based financial platform, they showed that the median income in Singapore is about 62,364 Singaporean dollars per year. That is about 46,200 US dollars in the same period. However, this data takes in the employer CPF contribution. Without this, the average median income is about $54,600 per year. Just glancing at this data, one can already imply that Singaporeans don't really make that much. Let's take another data from the Department of Statistics Singapore website. It shows the household income, which published that in 2023, the average household income is about $13,953. It might seem like a lot, but it's by the word household. It's also interesting to know that the statistics website also showed the difference in monthly household income by their type of dwelling. Or, to put it simply, where do they live? This shows who the crazy rich Singaporeans are. It shows that the one and two room HDB flats have a monthly household income of just $3,897 far short from the average household income of $13,958. If you go further, three-room HDB flats have an average income of $7,750 per month. The highest, of course, shows the reality of inequality. Landed properties have a monthly household income of over $28,169 per month. That is so much more than those who live in one- and two-room HDB flats. Beyond the income, it is also interesting to know that these households also receive government transfers. In 2023, resident households received $6,371 per household member on average from government schemes. This was higher than the previous year of just $5,859 and was due to the enhanced support measures for households during the period of high inflation and cushioning the impact of GST rate increase. Okay, now that we have a clear understanding of their income, let's talk about expenditure. Unfortunately, the latest data published by the Department of Statistics is back in 2018, which is too far from where we want today. But it might still be worth looking at the data to see and maybe adjust them by a few percent. Now, according to the data, the total average monthly expenditure of households in 2018 was about $5,904. Let's just adjust that and make a rough estimate of it using inflation. So from 2018 to 2023, it comes to about $6,397 at about 1.62% per year of inflation. Now, to be clear, this might be wrong, but we can still see that the household income far outweighs the household expenditure. In case you forgot, the average household income in 2023 is $13,958. So, we've got a bit of an excess in savings. Let's take a look at Singapore's household assets. SmartWealth reported that the mean and median net worth per adult in Singapore is a massive 516,991 Singaporean dollars and 134,308 Singaporean dollars, respectively. They also reported that they have an average debt per adult of about $72,831. There are also about 332,491 millionaires in the country. The only issue is that 16% of the adult population has less than $13,500 of wealth. Again, they are rich, but likewise, there will always be inequality. But that's also not an issue solely in Singapore, it's everywhere around the world. In aggregate, the Department of Statistics shows that the financial assets of Singapore is over $1.7 trillion, 
whereas the total assets sits at $3.1 trillion. Furthermore, the liabilities, which is money one owes, is just a small figure of $364 billion. This already shows just how rich Singaporeans are. They have so many assets, so many financial assets, yet their liabilities, their debt, is seemingly small. It is even more surprising that their financial assets are huge. They have about $611 billion in currency and deposits. These are likely money deposited in banks. Of course, one doesn't really make money from currency and deposits, albeit the interest rate from banks. But one should know that deposits are very, very important in any financial hub. They allow banks to lend more money to individuals and businesses, thus stimulating economic growth and fostering financial stability. Singapore also has $307 billion in shares and securities. These are investments held in a variety of financial instruments such as stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The significant amount of investment in shares and securities reflects the financial literacy and investment-savvy nature of Singaporeans. This tendency to invest in the stock market and other securities is facilitated by a robust and well-regulated financial system that Singapore has developed over the years. They have life insurances worth $268 billion and the Central Provident Fund at $571 billion. Life insurances are vital for providing financial security to individuals and their families in case of unforeseen circumstances. These policies can cover a range of situations such as death, disability, or critical illness, ensuring that the policyholder's dependents are not left in a financially vulnerable position. The large sum of $268 billion in life insurance in Singapore indicates a strong culture of financial planning and risk management among its citizens. The Central Provident Fund, or CPF for short, with its substantial fund size of $571 billion, plays a crucial role in Singapore's social security system. It is a mandatory savings plan for working Singaporeans and permanent residents, primarily designed to fund their retirement, healthcare, and housing needs. The CPF operates on a principle of self-reliance and lifelong savings, allowing individuals to save for retirement through a percentage of their monthly wages and employer contributions. This system not only ensures that individuals have a safety net in their later years, but also helps in managing healthcare and housing expenses, which are significant aspects of living in Singapore. The other $1.3 trillion in assets is from residential property, which is a no-brainer and may require no explanation. The liabilities, on the other hand, is $364 billion, of which $269 billion are mortgage loans, $95 billion are from personal loans, and $14 billion are from credit cards. Okay, now we have a clear picture of how rich Singaporeans really are. They have a household income higher than their expenses. They have net worth and assets far exceeding their liabilities and debt. They are indeed rich, but the concept of crazy rich may not touch every Singaporean. It is to those who belong not the 1%, but probably more accurately to the 10% of society. It's a problem, sure, but likely Singapore is doing whatever it can to help mitigate the inequality issues. As such, they have schemes and transfers from the government to ensure everyone has an equal chance in life. But of course, these data sets may not really reflect what everyday Singaporeans feel. There's an article published by the SCMP that stated, quote, If Singapore is so wealthy, why do its citizens feel stuck? They went on to show a survey which saw more than half of Singaporeans believe that they will experience little financial mobility over the next decade. Well, the issue could be due to the rise of living costs. As a global financial hub, Singapore has some of the highest living costs in the entire world world. Another factor is due to the rapid pace of technological advancement and global economic shifts, it could be causing anxiety among Singaporeans. In a fast-evolving economy, there can be uncertainty about job security and the skills required for future employment. The fear of being left behind in a competitive job market might contribute to the belief that upward financial mobility is limited. Additionally, social comparisons in highly developed society like Singapore can influence perceptions of financial mobility. In an environment where there's visible wealth and success, those who feel they are not progressing at the same pace 
may perceive themselves as being financially immobile, even if they're not doing poorly by objective standards. But anyway, do let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.